favorite subject of mathematics, the beauty of mathematics, and the really mathematics beauty. Of beauty. So, right. yeah. we've got one hour. Right, thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, I will be going into the beauty of mathematics and the mathematics of beauty slowly but as quickly as I can because it's very lovely that we've got new people here um, and from different approaches and disciplines. It's very, very lovely that. Um, but it means that I need to um, put across where I'm coming from, uh, which people who've been here for a while know. So, uh, but I'll, I'll just quickly say something I've realised. Uh, there was a title that I started talking to uh, a few years ago, which I've now realised is probably, um, will probably be a book and the various presentations that I've given, various uh, things that I've presented, are, will be chapters of this book. And, and the, the book title is Mathematics and Morality, Refining Awareness, Deepening Love. And uh, this, I will, this will be a question, why, why this is important will be emerging from what I'm saying, but I, I just like to start with that. It's, it's, when we go back to Plato, then this would not be at all surprising. But obviously, in our present climate, uh, if people who just mention morality with mathematics, some people are very surprised. So, uh, my, my current description, not definition, of mathematics uh, is the repository of living ideas in the universe of which humanity has become conscious. And symbolic mathematics is the above for which humanity has developed symbolic notation. So, Earlier today, uh, Garnet was talking about how our visual machinery dominates our thinking. And Lou was talking about how we've been inculcated with set theory, those of us who've grown up in mathematics. Um, I'm going back to, I, I'm saying that we have all been indoctrinated much more than that. If we go back and see that, or listen, or hear, that symbolic mathematics was a new invention, but was something that really came in in the middle of the second millennium. And in a way, it was Galileo who laid the foundations for it being, becoming such an, uh, an ideology because of he, he was the one who, he was revolutionary in his time and this is, there's, there's somebody famous who said, you know, that the, the revolutionary <laughs> ideas of today become the dogma of tomorrow. I mean, it's, it's obvious, really. Um, and, uh, but, but he wanted to think that the only reality was the reality of quantitative measure. And uh, in so doing, he made a big mistake, he actually made a big mistake because he was saying, you know, we can't trust the senses, we, we have to trust what we measure. But in fact, when he was saying that, he was, that is visual measure. So what he was actually saying is, we will only rely on vision. This is 
we've been suffering with that <laughs> increasingly ever since. Um, for my generation, you might have known from of Guy de Boer, who wrote a book called The Society of the Spectacle. And that's, that's what we're living with really. More and more so, the image of the spectacle. So, I was pointed, I was, I had some very interesting conversations already, it's been looking. And um, in one of them, you know, I was talking with Mark about, uh, well, I'm, yeah, I, I'm glad I just went back about the fact that when we think about Pythagoras, who was with his wife Theano, the, um, the, well, the source of, of the mathematics that we have today, the beginning, the origin of the mathematics we have today. Uh, we remember the Pythagoras theorem. That's what, what sort of you say, oh, Pythagoras, we say the Pythagoras theorem, <coughs> which is, of course, the geometry, the, the spatial aspect of Pythagoras' work. We forget that he was also the one who brought the knowledge of the ratios, the numerical ratios, the ratios between whole numbers as being the octave. So he brought amazing mathematics spatially, but also amazing mathematics in the auditory realm. And, uh, and I, I have this, I have a dream of finding ways to teach mathematics through hearing, through music. This gives a very different notion of measure. Visual measure, which, it, I mean, I think, yes, Peter has pointed this out as well in his talks, that visual measure is, is what has gone into quantitative measure. But the measure, if we, if we have musical measure, it comes not from the individual looking at it and, and going like this. It comes from listening. It comes from people playing music together, listening to each other. The whole, the whole cybernetic idea, the, the, the rapid feedback idea, is what is absolutely essential when we're making music. So this, this is a very different way of thinking of measure. And we, we have it, if we go back to you know, earlier uses of language, you know, we talk about a, a measured way of going on. And this is, this is to do with our internal, our internal sense. And hearing has a, has a much more internal feel. So if I have a, um, well, this is a bell. If I, if I had a, I could show what a glass or a plate. You ring something, then the tone. If it, if it's whole, then it's a beautiful tone. There's a tone. Beautiful. If 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 if, this, if the if the glass is cracked or a plate is cracked, we might not be able to see it. But if you ring it, you will hear it. Won't it? Won't ring. measure that we've imposed on time. And, uh, Nikki, are you bringing back that mathematics is more like an experience? I'm saying, I, I'm saying, with the, okay, so let's, let's look at the, I'm saying, so what happened, I mean, it, it was happening even after Pythagoras' time, already, um, I, I, in, in my academic work, when I was working for a PhD, I was, that's what I was doing. I was doing history and philosophy of mathematics. And I have, there, there's a lot of detail. Um, it's on my website. It's also in and out of the paper uh, about how what was lost of, of the ontology and of the mathematics from... So the mathematics that was then, we don't, we don't know it as of today, of what the mathematics was like back then. 
Well, um, it's lost in what's kind of No, no, no. I mean, obviously a lot is lost. There are always a lot is lost. But what, what is, what I'm saying is it's, I think it's possible now to reclaim and to, to regenerate and to regrow is the qualitative side of mathematics, yes. which, which also goes together with the spiritual and the moral side. And I think it relates also to the musical side. Of it. This is all, all the, the aspects that were lost from the Pythagorean early. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to bring in. So in that time, in, in the Middle Ages, going into the Renaissance, into the Enlightenment, it was an extraordinary time. Obviously, we all know that. But amazing time, we have amazing beauty and, and power that's come out of that. Uh, in terms of maths and science, the, the, the really huge thing was the introduction of the symbol for zero, and as such, the possibility of the number line, the decimal number line. Before that, we had the Roman numerals, and it, monks spent weeks calculating when Easter would be because it was so difficult to calculate. Um, the problem, the problem was that the symbol for zero had no. There was no ontology. There were a few mathematicians who were saying, "What, what is all this?" You know, because it suddenly there were, you know, there was there, were, there was a you know, zero something. We had negative numbers and then irrational numbers and you know, complex goodness, numbers. Complex numbers you know. I mean, interestingly, negative numbers have, have more problems mm. than irrationals. It's, it's, mm. it's very interesting. It, and that's another whole very interesting area. But just to come back to the, the, the fact that any that there was it was I mean mathematics at sea. So in fact, I think it's um, I think it was yeah I think it was Carbon Cardano who was asked you know you know well you know how can I use these irrational numbers because they are useful. That's I don't know what they are. I, they're, they're useful. You know. And so this pragmatic approach came in, um, and that's what we've been living with. And of course now, uh, and, and so it was then possible for mathematics to develop symbolically. Before that, mathematics had been ideas, and there were verbal formulations, and so it was the ideas. Um, <coughs> And, before, and if you go back to Pythagoras again, what, what, so what happened in the, cre the, the creation of the number line, these two very different ideas were pushed together. And this, these are the ideas of the integers and lines. Now, integers, whole numbers, are, are different are a different kind of entity from a line. They're, you know, they're, they're totally different words in, in, in Plato, so yeah. in, in ancient Greek times. Yeah. You know, the arithmoi are the whole numbers, and you could have, um, you know, megathos or... Megathos, yeah, megathos. Megathos is usually the thing, is for the line. It's continuous magnitude. It's, it's, for, it's continuous, so it's discrete and continuous. Uh, and but when when you when you, they're just pushed together in this and suddenly you've got you know, and so people think of you know numbers as as just points on a line you know, and uh, and also all all the, the issues of, about you know sort of come up and you know, came up later you know, with, with real numbers which are very, very wrongly called real numbers in fact I, I, the, there are some people who do call them decimal numbers. Which is, which is a much 
better way of describing them. Um, but all, all these things you know, arose from, from these contradictions. Can I say something very, very quickly? Sure. Just to, because I think it goes directly to what you've just been saying. It's very striking that for the ancient Greeks, not only was zero a number, obviously zero, the concept of zero had not been yeah. developed until, uh, an, 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 until the Arabs came, um, um, building possibly early Hindu contributions, but neither was one a number. Very clearly not. Neither was, neither was one a number for the Greeks. Uh, yes, it was a, the, the num one was the the principle of unity in an arithmos. Two was the smallest number. Exactly. Uh, because a number was by definition what they called a plethos or exactly. a determinate multiplicity. Exactly. And you couldn't have the de de determinate multiplicity of anything if there were not at least two of them. Exactly. So two was the smallest number for the Greeks. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that was it. Yeah. Because yeah. So one was. Yeah. The wholeness. <laughs> And that, that was what was Without which there could be no multiplicity. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And so that was, that was it. yes. I'm, I'm very interested in um, where our idea of quantifying growth came from. You know, particularly because we have this, we measure growth now, of course, with GDP, all of these mm. things. Now, I'm guessing in the ancient world they didn't think like that. Um, and of course, we there are some schools of thought in because um, we're, we're very concerned about you know how how far you can grow. Mm. But what was in in the, the mathematical system of the ancient world did they have a similar sort of exponential or, or, or infinite degree upon which something could grow, but or or was it, it was there were there limits? Did they did they think in terms of things in proportion? Well, very much so. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the very notion, of, I mean, the whole of Greek so-called arithmetic, in, in, it was rather misleading to describe as arithmetic, perhaps, but the whole theory of arithmetic is, is really grounded on the, the prior and, and more geometrical uh, theory of Eudoxus, which is a theory of the ratio, ratio and proportion amongst yeah. linear, uh, li, li, linear quantities. Exactly. I actually hesitate to even use the words quantity, yeah. but it's essentially... Um, the, the theory of ratio and proportion between intervals. And that was what took the place of what, you know, of whole number arithmetic. Yeah. Whole number arithmetic was thought of as derived from that. But I don't, don't want to keep on cutting across you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there was, there was an, in, an integral calculus. So there was a way of, of, of um, considering the whole number. And that was what was the differential calculus. So, which is, I mean, that was... Really, and, and yeah. certainly that is yeah. what we've we've lived on. Yes. Well, what I'm the reason that I'm I'm hopeful for a regeneration of the the Pythagorean qualitative mathematics and relating to music is because we have had in the end of the 20th century we have had things like topology and not theory cybernetics, well, but, but, but ideas that are not necessarily quantitative. And obviously, what has tended to happen is that people have wanted to quickly, you know, make metric spaces of everything, yeah. as far as it comes up. But uh, there are actual ideas that are not necessarily, that are not inherently quantitative. And, uh, come on. So yes, so uh, so that uh, yeah, so that was yeah, so based shall I go to this one? So so this is again what were the qualitative ideas of the Pythagorean? Well one I mean yeah, no no I mean quite yes, qualitative mathematics so so there was arithmetic A and there was logistic A. So arithmetic A was the study of the qualities of the whole numbers, and logistic A was the study of calculation. And they flowed into each other, obviously. So for example, all our ideas about odd and even square numbers, triangular numbers, those were all, those come out of, yes, the ratios and proportions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there were other ideas which were things like four relating to justice, etc., uh, which yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, these, these are interesting ideas that I haven't looked into in depth myself 
Marx as he knows someone who is alive, we'll find out about. But there is obviously, there's been a tendency to um, dismiss those totally. But even if, uh, even, but this would come back to, yeah, the, the, the spiritual aspect, which is important, which I'll, I'll be coming into when I, so I'm, I'm going to get on, I, yes, I want to get on to the mathematics of beauty and the beauty of mathematics because I, I also want to do, um, I would like you to do a thought experiment. But so I just want to complete on where I see mathematics. So I, I, well, so there's this formulation that came to me, which is that reality is greater than language, and language is greater than reason, and reason is greater than logic. And I consider mathematics to be a language or a number of languages, uh, and it, it's so, as I say, it, it's kind of like the first step of, 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 of our realization, of, of our attempting to situate ourselves in, in life, in a living world. We do it with ideas of which some, some we are conscious, obviously as we grow up, we are less, we are not conscious of the ideas that are kind of going into us. As we grow up, we start to choose Problem with that order. Language could be illogical. Well, exactly. Language is greater than logic. Yeah, logic is greater than language. No, well, we've, let's talk about that afterwards. So, let's let's come we'll come back to the mathematics, the beauty of mathematics, and the mathematics of beauty. Uh, how much do I want to say? before asking you to do an experiment. Maybe I'll ask you to do the experiment now. How many people have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We, we are, we're a quorum. Counting is so useful. I have 14 in there, so I need, and I have 12. So what I'm going to do, uh, in here I've got little pieces of paper with numbers on them, and I'm going to ask you to take out a number and then find the person who's got the same number. And then, I, because I, I, I want you, it's, it's a very simple thought experiment in pairs that I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to remember some beautiful experience in your life, which could be, you know, a visual beauty, it could be something you've experienced, it could be joy at the birth of a child, it, it, it could be seeing kindness somewhere. Or is it be world shifting, or is it just something representative? It's, it's something that, 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 where, where, that, that if you think of it, you think, that's beautiful. That, that was beautiful. So it was a time that it was just kind of like, kind of like a wow, beautiful. And so I want, I want you, you all to, to try to remember. So I, I sincerely hope you all have some memories. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with your partner, I will, I will give you all um, a piece of paper in each. And I, um, and I want you to, I'll start, I'll start going around doing this. So if you just take one. And uh, so then, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't done this very, I haven't done this very, what am I saying, so, um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, so then, I want you to, do you want to pass them around? Um, I want, one of, one, one of you to go first and to describe to your partner not what caused that experience, but how that experience felt. So it could be, you know, it, it, it could be fluttering, it could be yearning. It, so it's 
so you can describe it physically, you can describe it emotionally, you try to describe as, 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 as clearly as you can how that experience felt, and the partner will write it down. So one, per so one person is speaking, and the other person writes down, and then you do it the other way around. So, is it, are we going to tie this back to the mathematics of beauty? Yes. In relation, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'll explain. All right, yeah, yeah. So I'll explain. So the thing is that I'm interested in wait, wait, the mathematics of gesture. So Take you were in, asking about change, and that's it. So we've, we've, we've had for, you know, over 300 years now, a mathematics of mechanical change. Now, in the 20th century, uh, you know, sort of catastrophe theory came in, which is sort of looking at, you know, actually some kind of qualitative change, uh, but still in an obviously quantitative way, René Tom was sort of disappointed with what he could do in that way, um, but it obviously was important. I am interested in a very different kind of mathematics. I mean, this is the thing, this is why I'm saying to, to try to think back to before we thought of mathematics as, you know, can we write it down? Can we make an equation? Can we, or, I mean, the equal sign, you know, didn't come in until, um, I think, I think, was it the 1600s or even before, I was like, uh, 1700s, it was, it was very, very late. Well, I think it came in, but, oh, I mean, even then, it can't be slave, but it's like, so Robert, 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 but, you know, but, so what I'm saying is, if you think back, you know, what's your direct experience with it? Well, it's, 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 it, yeah, but it, it's kind of concept, it's, so shape, you see, like, in sort of topology, it, you know, has started to get a, a feel of shape. What I'm, I'm thinking is that there is the potential for, finding language which may at some time become symbolic, but it may be a different form. Okay. You see, the thing is that... Is the premise that the introduction of symbolic mathematics kind of instituted like a psychological and cultural shift in the representation of mathematics as a, as a qualitative science? Well, as a science, yes. I mean, it, it's totally, you know, yeah. We don't use like uh, rhythmoid anymore, we use logistic. Yeah, so what you're saying. Basically, that's the yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's an experiential kind of thing that you experience. I'm asking, when you have these qualitative arithmetic, are you experiencing like the hardness and the, the, the shape of mathematics of the universe? Is that well, yeah, we are. You see, if if I mean, so in Mark's talk, he was talking about Pierce, who had who was talking about firstness, secondness, and thirdness. So. The, the difference, what well, I'm getting, obviously, you know, Peter's done so the difference between, you know, well, like, if you just say, if you think within quantitative mathematics, within non it's a like, box. Yeah, wait, wait, no, no, if you think within quanti quantitative mathematics, one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, they are all have such different natures, even thinking within quantitative mathematics. But I mean, when Pe I remember Peter's starting was brilliant. Uh, this, is, uh, this must go back at least 10 years when you, you gave a, a talk on two and two. You know. Also, what about individual natures of individual numbers? Well, yeah, so, so that was it. You, the, when you think about, we, so we think about one, two, three, four, five, as just as, as, as counting. Yeah. But in fact, <coughs> yeah, yeah, when you think of oneness yeah. and two-ness, these are different kinds of worlds. Two-ness, three-ness, there's very different possibilities. Two people are very different from three people. I see. Four people, again. And, and you see it, and, and so you see it in social groupings. Yeah. You see it in animal Three's groupings. Three's a crowd, two's a pair. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, but, but also psychophysiologically. Let, has everybody got a number now? Yeah. Okay, can you find your pairs? Who's got W? <laughs> w? w? Three? Who has S? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the camera. So, when you say your pairs, you mean. Are you, you you have, have some, some people are going to need to move. Uh, uh, I mean, you could all. I know it's a bit difficult. No, no. Who is I'm very, 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 very
back top. I mean, the idea of commentating that man has come back in a big way. Feel annoyed 
that it, it, it worked that way, but why does it work that way, not some other way, and, and try to take it apart? And you're allowed to do that, and that's part of the beauty of it as well. Um, and, and, and see what happens if you might put it together another way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, uh, it, it opens up into, into almost all of your human actions and emotions. Yeah, 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 very much. I mean, there's a, uh, to quote Rilke, um, das Schöne ist nichts als der Anfang der Schrecklichen. Und wir bewundern es so, dass es verschmäht, uns zu zerstören. Jeder Engel ist schrecklich. The beautiful is nothing but the beginning of a terror. And we're amazed that it disdains to destroy us. Every angel is terrible. <coughs> and actually, I, I think I've only got a little time. I'll, I'll lead into what I, what I really do want, want to say. And I, like, I would like the sheeps, and I welcome anything anybody else will bring me about how they felt in other Etc. So, but I, I really, because I, I just want to get, because having mentioned Wilke, I mean, this is, this is where uh, it's coming to the beauty of mathematics and the mathematics of beauty. So, yeah, the, I talked about the mathematics of gesture. I would just like to mention that uh, there's a, a neuroscientist called Professor Semirzeki who did experiments. Uh, to, to, to find out if there was any uh, neurological correlation between people's experiences of beauty. And he found that there were, and, and in terms of what people found beautiful, there was not a, there was some correlation, but not so much. But in terms of the, the the, 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 what was happening neurologically, when people experience beauty, and this included mathematicians, uh, he found he, the, it was the frontal motor cortex and the medial. And when they experienced ugliness, then it was the amygdala, and I've forgotten what the other is, I'm going to put it down here. Um, but, yeah, well, I think it, it could be that, wouldn't it? Um, but it was so that the, the point was that the experience of ugliness was stimulating the parts of the brain that get stimulated in aggression, basically. Uh, so this is, uh, so this leads me on to something that I, I think is at the moment is, would, be, would be a very nice definition, but a description, not definition, a description of, of, of how one, one aspect, um, even that, you see, I mean, it's, that's, that's a, a visual metaphor. I'm, I'm so aware of these, that they, they run through, through all. So, thinking of Rilke and and the kind of awe, when we experience something as beautiful, I mean, the, the more amazingly beautiful we experience something, the more it is awe, in, in the true sense of the word. And this is taking us beyond ourselves to something greater, whether we call it the oneness, the universe, God, whatever, but it's, it's beyond our usual human experience. And obviously Plato uh, talked about beauty, truth, and the good. And his dialectic and also mathematics was a way to become part of that 
that really mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, I've written God, how interesting. I change between godness and goodness. Yeah, you've got a problem now, you can't cross out God. So did well, God. No, so <laughs> <laughs> was it
How was he? How did he deal with relativism? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't know that anybody. I mean, I don't know that. I mean, because if there's a you know, I know better than me. I. I mean, you know, the, I'm just trying to. I haven't read all the Socratic dialogues, so I don't know whether anybody put that question. Because um, that's what you know, that's, that's what we have is the, is this, is the dialectic. Um, so um, I know mean, obviously what the situation we have now is that if people call different things beautiful, and what I'm all I'm saying is that it's. Uh, well, if you think about it, according to Peter's work, um, everything's trying to unify anyway. That's what you're saying. Well, I'd like to point to you. I noticed that when I was younger, particularly the appreciation of music, that I had, uh, I could detect in myself when I watched myself, that for me, a large part of the handling of music was to see if other people liked it. And I had problems if they didn't like the music that I liked. I think I've got a bit freer of that latterly, mm -hmm. but it points up a certain type of problem, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I saw more clearly three minutes ago. Um, but in fact, there is an issue of what we're trying to communicate, what we're trying to do with music. Mm -hmm. And um, the, then the problem is if you, ah, that seemed like a weak approach when I look back on it. Mm -hmm. And then when I think, ah, but I can just revel in the music and like it which I'm more capable of doing these days, I'm beginning to think that perhaps the earlier position was the more positive position because it's seeking link to other people through this abstract link, that abstract language as it were. And the disappointment comes to try better next time to form a link. When you hear, see lots of people listening to music on their own these days, it makes me now wonder whether they've lost the point of what it is about. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, people you know, do go to festivals and concerts. <laughs> 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 Mainly, like they sit the same music. <laughs> Why people like some of the same song? Like, that's a really good hit. I really like that song. Was the artist mm -hmm. effective in conveying what he was trying to, to use mathematical musical language to really get across his point? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly. And clearly, you know, that there are, there's a psychiatrist with respect to music. You know, you can see it very, very clearly. For different ages and diff different kinds of them, and that whole issue of what kinds of music it goes together. I mean, the, 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 you know, it is the, the, well, the, the kinds of music, the kinds of architecture, the kinds of transcendent science, the kinds of politics. You look across, um, you, know, you go through time, and you see that there is a zeitgeist. There is, a, you know, there is a relationship between baroque music and baroque architecture. I wanted to speak to Tony's reveling in it. Yeah. Um, a lot of music, maybe almost all, if you look back into what it is historically, is designed to get people dancing together and so on. So it's designed not so much that they're liking it as participating with it in the wedding ceremony or whatever it is. And, and so the liking it is secondary to the participating. Yeah. And on the other hand, uh, there's a little criticism of uh, the person who just revels in it all by himself, like singing in the shower, the loss of discipline or something. Um, it's, uh, everybody has a tendency to feel that it should be communal. There's something about that communal sense with music. Yes. But I'm not making a judgment here one way or the other. I think you are closer to what I'm latterly deciding that actually the the will to communicate through music is not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's both hands. Yes. I, I think it is both an ad. I, I would say I think there is a downside to the communal aspect too, which is, uh, you know, if if your if your judgment is music is too much driven, which it very often is amongst young people, dare I say it? Uh, now I can speak as a you know an, a, an official old fart <laughs> um, by you know by peer pressure and by the desire to approve of what is approved of by your by your you know age cohort. Then that seems to be to be not at all a good reason for. <laughs> No. Uh, judging a piece of music, um, and I, I take your point. Obviously, the you know, solitude, but I think there is a place for solitude in listening to music as well. Those, those are both and thing. I agree. It's not it's definitely not neither or. What about the solitude? Oh. 
Okay, last comment. Yeah, this is really the last comment. <laughs> <laughs> last word. Yeah, last word. No, I, I, I wanted to say something about uh, uh, talking together before uh, with uh, Mark and, and Lou. Uh, I said it's a co complete different experience of uh, uh, listening to music uh, uh, at a live concert uh, with an audience or alone uh, at home. But that doesn't mean that uh, one is uh, without, uh, without meaning because uh, I have a, a sense of music. I like, that's my personal feeling, but I like music that makes me think about the structure of music. So, and there is some music which is just banal and uh, uh, I can't even take it to consideration as music. So uh, the, it depends probably from my uh, uh, psychological type uh, uh, that Jung would classify as an introvert more than an extrovert, yeah. but so I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Nikki, yeah. oh, sorry, Nicole, I'm sorry, Nicole, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>